Joining me today is Dr. Lowry Stokes Sims, curator at the Museum of Arts and Design and celebrated art historian. The first African American curator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Dr. Sims was instrumental in growing the museum's collection to include a greater number of minority and women artists. She's received numerous awards for her 30 years of dedication to expanding the discourse on contemporary art. Today we'll be discussing the highlights of her incredible career and more. Larry, welcome to Give and Take. Thank you so much, Julie. We haven't seen each other in such a long time. It's I know, very it's been a to couple of years. It's great to yeah, see you. Same here. So you were born in Washington, D.C., right. raised in Queens, New York. Right. Chart for me your path becoming the first African-American curator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Well, it wasn't really a path. I think it was just a, a series of stumbles, you know, because I didn't know exactly what I was doing. But when I was growing up, the, our family was very art-focused. And uh, there were three of us. I have a brother and a sister. I was the oldest. And we sort of fell into different art parts. Um, I fell into sort of the studio section. My brother followed in my father's footsteps. He was an architect, and he later became a building inspector. What does the studio section mean? Um, painting, drawing, that type of thing. And then my sister was a dancer. And um, she actually had a career as a ballet dancer in Europe and here before she retired. And then she sort of took over the studio art part because she got involved in costuming and now works for Euro Disney. And so what though led you to the Metropolitan Museum of Art? I think it was um, maybe a, a dream projection because when I was a kid, my parents took us to museums all the time and I particularly loved the Met. And when I was in high school and could you know, make the trip from Queens to Manhattan by myself, that was a big deal. Um, I remember coming at 14 to see the Mona Lisa when it came over. And when I turned 16 and got a job as a sales girl at Woolworths, one of the first things I did with my salary was I took out a membership at the Mu Metropolitan Museum of Art. And when I couldn't get different boyfriends to t go to openings with me or go to the museum, <laughs> my father would do it, you know. So I really got to know the Met um, when I was in high school. Then I went to, I was at Queens College, so, you know, it was still a continuation of coming over to Manhattan, and by that time I broadened my museum experience to include the Whitney and the Museum of Modern Art, and galleries along 57th Street. There was a period where, you know, most of the galleries were right there in a very contained area. And uh, my classmates and I, we would troop over and, uh, you know, really, when I look back on it now, we were looking at the burgeoning of earthworks, of electronic art, of Latin American art. Gallery Denise Rene was there. And were those some of the priorities that you had in going to the Met? Because the fact that they did not have an African-American curator prior to you, that certainly must have been not only a tremendous challenge to you, but also an incredible opportunity. Well, I think it was a, t a terrific opportunity. And and I think that the way that my race and gender f fell into it was really in the larger context of contemporary art and what opportunities there were for women and a much more diverse audience. I arrived at the Metropolitan in the early 70s. It was in the wake of the Harlem On My Mind show, which had been very controversial because the Harlem community had expected an exhibitions of painting and sculptors by well-known artists based in Harlem. And it was, in fact, a very effective and very wonderful photo essay on Harlem that did a lot to revive the career of James Van Der Zee, who was sort mm -hmm. of the quintessential photographer of Harlem. So in that wake, the museum had to now deal with this community. You know, it wasn't, it, it, it was like the watershed from it being an exclusive enclave for the well-to-do or the middle class, and now sort of looking at what kinds of issues around the community. So I entered the Metropolitan Museum in uh, the community programs department, where we were sort of really making the resources of the Met available to communities through workshops, through exhibitions to the burgeoning community of small art museums that are now very mature, the Bronx Museum of Art, the Queens Museum, for example. And then um, it was really about figuring out how to serve different communities. And I worked a lot with senior citizens and senior citizen centers. But in the, in the midst of all this, um, I really wanted to use my art history. I was an art history major, graduated from Queens and had done my master's at Johns Hopkins. So I was a kind of interesting hybrid, you know, of someone who 
really was very interested in the scholarly aspects of art history and museum work, but also was very much committed to making this institution and these artworks accessible to a larger number of people, and also broadening the museum's purview of who they included in their acquisitions well, and Well, that's their what I want to talk about, because how do you make the museum accessible to the communities you're speaking about when so many of the works of art are still by white males? Well, that's still a question that we still have, you know, actually. And um, I remember doing a lot of um, activities and outreach, which I had conceived of in, co you know, conversation with a lot of my peers. Uh, Leslie King Hammond has been a lifelong friend from school, and she was working in Baltimore. And then even working within the, uh, my colleagues within community programs, the whole idea was how can we get these artists in the community who we were hiring to do programs and to do workshops onto the walls. And it was a constant and very consistent and hard battle. And um, it, again, circumstances helped to propel it because about 10 years, well, well almost about 10 years into my tenure in the museums, the whole a uh, critical and theoretical focus of the art world changed and we had the introduction of multiculturalism, we had the introduction of diversity as these kinds of rubrics for art and post-structuralism and deconstruction and things like that. So um, in that sense, all the associations I had had in the early 70s when I came into the field with women artists in particular and with artists in color, all of a sudden was really vaunted to the center of the art discourse in New York and around the world. And that made it slightly easier. But one of the things I sort of really realized is that, you know, the museum is, is a, as an institution is a series of coalitions of different communities. And each community has to make its contribution for it all to well, work. Which communities in particular are all you right. talking about? You have the museum staff, the curators. You have educators. Then you have dealers. Then you have uh, collectors. And then you have critics and uh, writers. And what you need is to sort of have all those working to sort of really validate uh, the work of different artists. And that started to really happen. Um, one of the most exciting aspects, I think, of the 80s and the 90s was the really growth of a affluent um, African American, uh, in particular, um, you know, a, a population. Um, you know, as more younger African Americans got into Wall Street and to different kinds of professions, the whole sort of profile of what was, you know, an African American changed, although it still seems to be quite hidden. And um, then, uh, if you were lucky and you did your work, you can do your outreach to them. And a lot of them had had art in school. Some of them had wanted to be in the art field, but of course were discouraged by the rel relatively lower <laughs> salaries. And um, so it was a wonderful moment, you know, where you could begin to sort of have friends groups, affiliate groups, and people who were contributing to the financial f health of the museums. And that is a power base for you when you're trying to sort of make uh, your plea or your argument for certain kinds of exhibitions and acquisitions. But when you're bringing communities into the museum during your tenure there, how would you deal with the fact, particularly with young people, where they would say, I don't see any women artists or I don't see any artists of color here. Where are the artists who look like me? Well, it was, it was difficult. I mean, I think, you know, for a while, um, I think where culture was concerned, the advantages that you had at the Met was that you had Chinese collections, you had Japanese collections, you had East Indian collections, you had African collections, you had some Latin American collections, and, or you at least had Spanish. So you could sort of fudge it, you know, in, in that sense, but I think that one of the things that the museum did learn, you know, over these, you know, 20 years, uh, past 20 or 30 years, th is that people wanted to see themselves as Americans, as these hyphenated American phenomena. And um, this was able to happen at the Met in around the mid-90s, because that was the moment when the museum really looked to itself, really began to examine what was happening with the staff who was getting promoted, 
um, how we were dealing with di different kinds of issues around gender, race, family, uh, work issues, and things like that. And the museum did a, a gigantic self-examination uh, of itself around these issues of diversity. As a spin-off from that, we were able to establish a staff group to sort of deal with diversity and also to think about reaching out for audiences. At the time, I remember, the museum did a study of <clears throat> the potential of the museum over the next 20 years. And one of the chapters in the study that I happened to see said multiculturalism. So yeah, mm -hmm. I flipped right there <laughs> to sort of see what was happening. And it was kind of interesting because it was really sort of a 1970s community ghetto model. And I sort of What do you mean by that? You know, we go out and we bring the young ghetto children in mm -hmm. and we sort of give them so enrichment. Sort of a paternalistic view Extremely of the world. Extremely paternalistic. So I said to the museum, the world has changed. We have now an affluent group that can bring resources to the museum, both in terms of context and monetary resources. We fortunately had the example of the Friends of Education at MoMA, which was a group that was founded specifically to promote and uh, encourage programming and acquisitions specifically around African American artists. So we started the multicultural, um, uh, multicultural Audience Development Initiative. I have to sort of remember that, Madi. And uh, one of the key figures was Richard Clark, who was uh, on the board of the Metropolitan mm -hmm. Museum representing the borough of Manhattan. And he and I had a conversation, and he wanted to make a, co a specific contribution while he was on the board. And I said, Richard, this is the time to do this, because we have all these currents going on in the museum internally, so it would be behoove the museum to sort of move it out externally. And I have to say, the great thing was that we, from the beginning, we had the support of Felipe de Montebello, who was the director right. then. And when you have that kind of top-down commitment, that really makes a difference.